All right. So uh, last fall, I got a panicked email from the North Carolina chapter of Trail of Tears. One of the speakers for the national conference at the last minute couldn't come and they asked me, can you give a talk? I said, about what? About anything. So uh, I, I pulled this together. And if you've heard it before, I changed it a whole lot since then. Um, so we're gonna walk through this. Now, anybody who knows me knows that I like movies. So one of my favorite movies is A Few Good Men. Now, in the movie, the, the questions are whether or not Jack Nicholson as the Colonel ordered the code red on Private Santiago. Dawson and Downey will have their day in court, but they'll have it with another lawyer. Another lawyer won't be good enough. They need you. You know how to win. You know they have a case, and you know how to win. If you walk away from this now, you've sealed their fate. Their fate was sealed the moment Santiago died. Do you believe they have a case? You and Dawson, you both live in the same dream world. It doesn't matter what I believe. It only matters what I can prove. So please, don't tell me what I know, and don't. So it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what I believe. It doesn't even matter what I know. It only matters what I can prove. That's the heart of research. We deal in history, not in mythology. So to prove something, you have to have evidence. And there's all kinds of evidence. Direct evidence, indirect evidence, hearsay evidence, negative evidence, biased evidence and contradictory evidence. Proof has different standards. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt in the world of history is, is probably unattainable. Most people are kind of familiar with proof based on preponderance of evidence. But really what you would like is you want clear and convincing proof. Now, in that, there's levels of confidence. Are you certain? Is it probable? Is it likely? Is it apparently so? Is it perhaps so? Or is it, well, maybe it could be so. So to do research, you need to do a reasonably exhaustive search of all available act records. You can't perform a reasonably exhaustive search if you don't put some effort into first identifying and accessing all those records. You wanna to try to squeeze as much as you can out of every clue you find. Don't limit your search to one type of source or document. Build a timeline for the evidence you find. Evaluate and reevaluate all the evidence address and attempt to resolve contradictions. Engage in self-evaluation. Make sure you're not forcing your expectations and presumptions on the evidence and reading more or less than what is there. Develop conclusions, but don't hold them with a death grip. Is your conclusion consistently logical or is it just a mishmash? That's a technical term. Be your own toughest critic. Identify any holes in your work. Write up a site report. Publish or present your findings. Seek out honest critiques. Blind spots are called blind spots for a reason. Ask yourself who created the record. Is it an original record? Is it a derivative record? Is it a transcription? Is it a paraphrase? Why was the record created in the first place? Did the creator have an agenda? Was the creator looking to enrich or advance themselves in some way? Was the creator biased? Was the creator actually in a position to know what it was they were talking about? Did the creator have a reputation for truth, for falsehood, for accuracy, or for sloppiness? Was the creator, was the record created at the time of the event or later, just from recollection? Are there any unique parameters to correctly interpret the record? Admit your own limitations. None of us can be all things to all people. Believe in practice and collegiality. Build a team 
of others who are experts. Partner with people who have skills and knowledge you lack and learn from them. Educate yourself. Don't be defensive. Ask questions of others. Share with others. There's lots of people who will ask and whine that so-and-so doesn't share their research with them, but they never do research and share anything with anybody. Don't expect others to do your work for you. Review all the literature that you can dealing with a similar research issue. Read footnotes and the source citations. Some practical suggestions if you're doing research is keep a research log, utilize it, update it, review it. What have you done? Where have you looked? Review any other articles, site reports, site certifications for similar locations or routes. Learn what sources, strategies, or methodologies those people used. When I say cite your sources, don't assume everybody knows what you know. Don't assume everybody will understand what you meant to say. Be clear, be complete. Make it as easy as you can for others to find the exact records you found. Those same records can help others with their research in a way you may never have imagined. To have evidence, to have proof, means you have to have a question that's being answered. It's just information if there's not a question. Evidence relates to the question that you're asking. So the question I was faced with was, what was the specific location of Fort Lovell used in 1838 for the removal of the Cherokee in Northeast Alabama? This is the famous or infamous map by Keyes. And Fort Lovell was shown there. And it says it was 34 miles from Rome and 20 miles from Fort Likens. And this map, while well known, is not particularly useful. Uh, back in the early mid 2000s, the Alabama chapter was involved in a report for the Park Service on the removal in Alabama. And there were several of us. I was one, Lamar Marshall, Larry Smith, late Gail King uh, was the director. So the search for this fort began 20 years ago almost. And the first piece of evidence that was found is a listing of volunteer posts and stations of the Army of the Cherokee Nation, May 1838. You start at uh, number 13, Ross's Landing in Tennessee, 45 miles estimated distance from the agency. There were two mounted companies there. Fort Cumming near Lafayette, Georgia was 70 miles with one mounted company. Fort Likens in Broomtown Valley was said to be 110 miles with one mounted company. Fort Lovell, number 16, near Cedar Bluff, Alabama, 114 miles in one infantry company. Number 17, Fort Payne, near Rawlinsville, 101 miles with one mounted company and two infantries. So implying here that Fort Lovell was four miles from Fort Likens, but that was just an estimate. Now, if you don't know the geography of Alabama, this is in Cherokee County, what's presently Cherokee County, which was kind of the southern end of the Cherokee Nation um, and the other counties around it. Every state and every county, uh, every place has different kind of records. Uh, in Alabama, Mississippi were originally part of Georgia or claimed by the state of Georgia. When Georgia went through the uh, Yazoo land fraud in 1807, um, the state of Georgia was in such financial distress that they uh, turned their rights to this land over to the U.S. government. So Alabama is the only one of the uh, uh, former Cherokee lands which were surveyed by the uh, U.S. government. And with those, there are uh, field notebooks. And the field notebooks the surveyor noted where Fort Payne was. 
He also noted where Fort Likens was. He did not note where Fort Lovell was. Now there is a lot of tradition in Alabama about Fort Payne and the family that owns the site where Fort Likens is, is the same family who's owned it since the 1840s. And they had a tradition that that's where the fort was. But there is no tradition about where Fort Lovell was. No local, and barely any, none, no local memory of the fort. There he is, uh, thanks to Stephen Dennis, who is on this, this uh, presentation today, uncovered baggage transportation records uh, in the vouchers, the third auditor settled account. One of them is an 1838 voucher of Thomas Rogers for the transportation of baggage from Fort Payne to Fort Lovell, 22 miles. From Fort Lovell to Fort Likens, 15 miles from Fort Likens to Gunner's Landing, 70 miles. From Gunner's Landing to Fort Cass, 158 miles. So Fort Payne's a known place, Fort Likens is a known place, Gunner's Landing is a known place, and Fort Cass is a known place. The miles shown from Gunner's Landing, from Fort Likens to Gunner's Landing matches. And the miles from Gunner's Landing to Fort Cass match. So it gives you confidence that what Rogers said was the mileage from Fort Lovell to Fort Likens is correct. And if you remember back to your high school geometry, you should be able to triangulate. You have here five different points, uh, but the three in, in importance are the mileage from Fort Payne and the mileage from Fort Likens to Fort Lovell. It should be simple, you'd think. It should be absolutely simple. It should not be a problem. Until you see how many roads there actually were. Now, when you look at a map, you can't tell from a map what's a major road, what's a minor road, and what is little more than a goat path through the woods. It is simply something the surveyors noted. Now, Cherokee County, uh, where this was, um, suffered a fire in the 1880s and every, every record in the county was burned. Not some, every last one, except for two books of chancery court records that a lawyer had taken home that night to review a case. So other than that, there are absolutely no county records for Cherokee County. Now, what people who know me know that one of my uh, hot button issues is when you look at a map that shows the Cherokee Nation and it appears to be a big black hole in the middle of nowhere, that there was nothing in the Cherokee Nation. However, you know that's not actually true. The Cherokee had a functioning government. It had districts, it had court officers, it had legislative bodies. It had its own internal infra transportation infrastructure. Here's an example from 1819. This is a, a petition from the big rattling gourd, William Grimmett, Betsy Broom, she was the widow of the Broom, Daniel Griffin, Mrs. Lassley, who lodged a complaint before the chiefs at Newtown of a certain company of persons who had formed a combination and established a turnpike arbitrarily in opposition to the interests of the above named persons, pro pro proprietors of a privileged turnpike on the same road. The council and committee abolished the new company and affirmed that this is the, as the only legal proprietors of a turnpike on the said road leading from Widow Fools at the Forks of Hightower to Wills Creek by way of Turkey Town. Their responsibility for upkeep was to commence at the first creek east of John Fields, known by the name of where Van was shot, and to continue westward to the extent of their limits. Additionally, when a fool was required to maintain the road for the benefit of her ferry, that's the same ferry that John Ross came to own, from the first creek 
to where Ridge's Road now intersects the road east of her ferry. Ridge was charged to maintain the road from two runs east of his ferry by his ferry to where his road intersects the old road leading from the fork west of his ferry. The High Tower Turnpike Company, the different company entirely, was to maintain the road from the two runs to where it intersects the federal road near Blackburn's. So this is 1819 and there's evidence of an advanced transportation infrastructure already within the Cherokee Nation. The removal is not a political action, it's a military action. There were gonna be lots of wagons and lots of horses and lots of supplies and lots of moving of people from place to place, soldiers and Cherokee. That would not happen on a goat path and it wouldn't happen on a third grade road. The military was going to look for the most efficient way to move people, wagons, horses, supplies. Uh, in 1842, there was a claim. If you know what an 1842 claim is, thank Mary Bell Chase. Jesse Bushyhead, Captain Bushyhead, Archibald Murphy, Johnson Murphy, and Johnson Fields, provide proprietors of a turnpike road from Calhoun, Tennessee, to Fort Armstrong, Alabama, and a branch of the old agency on Hiawassee intersecting said road 25 miles from Calhoun. Fort Armstrong was a War of 1812 fort in Alabama. Also in 1842, Johnson Fields filed a separate claim on the very same turnpike for his specific share. There were Cherokee owned and operated ferries all through the nation. These are the ferries were on the Chattooga River and the Coosa River in Alabama. There were, they were valued in 1836. The value of a ferry as an income producing property was based not on the fact that it was a ferry, but on the income and the revenue it produced. And these are not consistent when you look at them. What this is implying is that there was more traffic across certain ferries than others. What that points to is what were the major roads? There were ferries on the rivers that had no connection in 1836 to a Cherokee. So those were ferries that whites had come in and, and set up. There's a ferry at Galesville, uh, William Grimmett, William Lasty, Widow Watts, that's the widow of the, the famous Chickamauga chief, John Watts, Mrs. Broom, again, the widow of the Broom, and Major Ridge for 20, almost $2,600 value. The Nesbitt Cothran Ferry, also known as Sally Barks Ferry or Dated Vans Ferry, was valued at 600. The Hampton Ferry, which was owned by uh, James Hughes, Richard Ratliff, uh, James Lastly, and Jonathan Mulkey, was had a value of a little over $2,000. The Garrett Ferry, which was also known as Ridges Ferry or Childers Ferry, originally it was Path Killers Ferry, the principal sheet, was the most valuable at 14,000, which shows you it was a major transportation corridor. The Cross Ferry, Smith Valley, these are going further down the river. Or Lastly Ferry was valued at 1,000. Fitz Ferry, K Ferry, Mrs. who was uh, one of the wives of Path Killer, was 1,100. And the Walker Ferry or John Riley's Ferry uh, was the last one at present day gas and it was valued at 8,000. So what this shows you is that all roads are not equal. Some are major roads. And if you look, this is John Lacherette's map from 1838. And where these ferries were, he has them shown as roads and the only roads he's shown. So this gives you a sense of where were the major roads, where were the major transportation corridors in this area. On the 16th of January, 1832, the state of Alabama extended its governance and authority over the Cherokee and the Muscogee lands in the state, 16th of January. A couple of five days later, all the lands 
Cherokee and Muscogee, east of Wills Valley, was attached to the county of St. Clair, January 21st. February of 1832, the county court of St. Clair, that one of the first acts they did is they declared certain roads to be public highways. Ordered by the court, the road leading from William Chandler's on Wills Creek to the Georgia line near David Vance by the way of John Riley's and thence on the road where the road now runs until it comes one, within one mile of an Indian by the name of George Campbell and then take the old way to do, on to James Lasky's, then on to the ferry on Coosa River called Path Killers, and thence to the Georgia line to be a public road. The road from Melton Scott's on to Terrapin Creek, thence to the Georgia line, he declared a public highway. The road leading from John Garrett's ferry on Coosa to the intersection of the Terrapin Creek Road as now laid out, he declared a public highway. The road from Ross's, that would be John G. Ross, up Wills Valley to the county boundary be declared a public highway. The road called the Tennessee and Georgia Road leading by Richard Ratliff on to Tennessee and Georgia be declared a public highway. And these last, this next one is a creek turnpike. The road leading from Camulga to the Georgia line via the same and the same be declared a public highway the road known by the name of the McIntosh Road. Something wouldn't be declared a public road if it had been a public road. So all of these, this suggests these were all Cherokee turnpike roads or Creek turnpike roads. Also in the county records are, and this is St. Clair, before Cherokee County was formed, road orders ordered by the court that Daniel Lemons, Henry Smith, George Johnson, Eli Watts, Andrew Donaldson be appointed commissioners to review and mark out a road from Chattooga Valley Road near the camp meeting grounds. This camp meeting grounds was where the Cherokee Nation met in governance after they were kicked out of Georgia, but before they went to Red Clay. Near the camp meeting grounds, passing near again, Fort Armstrong. Thence cross to Coosa near the mouth of Spring Creek, then to the old village on Terrapin Creek. Ordered by the court that George Birdwell be appointed overseer of the road from Little River to the Chattooga Ferry. Ordered that Jacob Horton be appointed overseer of the road from Chattooga Ferry to the Georgia line. Ordered that Evan Parker be appointed overseer of the road from Chattooga Ferry to the state line on the Tennessee Road. That would have been Broomtown Valley. In the U.S. Constitution, the First Amendment gets talked about a lot, but the last part of it is rarely ever mentioned much anymore. And it is the right to petition the government for a redress of grievances. In the 19th century, this was one of the, if not the, there were no political action committees and, and very few, if any, lobbyists. The, citizen, the citizens petitioned the government for a redress of grievances. One of the principal points that was petitioned were post offices and postal routes. Again, thanks to Stephen Dennis, this is a December 16, 1833 transcription of a petition for a mail route from Calhoun, Tennessee to Asheville, Alabama. Asheville was a county seat and still is of St. Clair County. By the way of John Walker's Sarah Robertson's scrape shins on Chickamauga, up the Pea Vine Branch, and on to the Military Spring on Old Fort Armstrong Road to Israel Standifers near the line between Georgia and Alabama, thence to Asa Brindley's, thence to the fort on Little River, this is again Fort Armstrong, near the mouth of Spring Creek, thence to Asheville, Alabama. Uh, the names all highlighted in yellow are not white. These are Cherokee who also signed this petition. On this map, you can see Fort Armstrong here and Turkey Town, which was slightly below it. 
in the records of the US House of Representatives, there are clues to roads. This is on a motion for Mr. Lee of Tennessee resolved that the committee of the post office and post roads be instructed to inquire into the expediency of establishing a mail route from Calhoun in the county of McMinn in the state of Tennessee, passing by Richard Taylor at Cherokee, who lived, I think, Jack, you can correct me, um, near present day Ringgold, and John Brown, this is the same John Brown who owned the, the quote unquote tavern at Chattanooga. He had a, another home in what's now Chattooga County. Uh, thence down the Chattooga River and Valley, crossing the Sid River near a campground, thence crossing the river at Nesbitt's Ferry, thence crossing Terrapin Creek at Adams Ford, and thence by Jacksonville to Talladega Courthouse, State of Alabama. And the uh, U.S. statutes at large, there are reports in there of postal routes. And these are just some indicative ones during this time period. A postal route was established from Rome by Livingston to Pleasant Green or Gamble Seminary near the line of Walker and Floyd counties to Island Town on the Chattooga River from Dallas and Hamilton County, Tennessee, through the lookout in Wills Valley via Reason Rollins, the seat of justice for DeKalb County to Bennettsville in St. Clair County. From Calhoun McMinn County via Walker's Place, McDaniels, Richard Taylor's, the Walker Courthouse in Georgia, William Henry's, Charles Price's, Darty's Mills to Chattooga or Galesville, across Smith's Ferry on the Coosa River, to Adam Fra Francis Adams, Rawdon Stores, to Jacksonville in Benton County. From Belfont in Jackson County, which is on the uh, Tennessee River, via DeKalb Courthouse and Cherokee Courthouse to Jacksonville, Benton County. From Cherokee Courthouse in Alabama, via Chattooga, Old Town, Hopkinsville, Beavers, and Pleasant Green to Island Town. From Fayette, Georgia, by Hopkinsville, through the Chattooga Valley by Chattooga Old Courthouse. And that is the old Cherokee Chattooga District Courthouse and Jeffersonville, which is should be Jefferson, but it's recorded as Jeffersonville, to Jacksonville. So there are lots of records for that either directly or imply what is a major road. And the military would use these they would be looking for major roads. So this is the, uh, the area of the Chattooga River. Uh, when this map uh, was surveyed, it shows there were bridges and not ferries at this point. In the uh, records at uh, the National Archives of the Office of the Quartermaster General, and no, none of these are digitized or microfilmed that I'm aware of. Um, several different entries. The consolidated correspondence files, the files, the letter sent of Captain Abner Hetzel. He was the quartermaster in charge of the Cherokee removal. Uh, entry 352, letter sent and received. List of persons employed, supplies issues, forage issues, and supplies received one volume, miscellaneous papers, six inches. In this, there's a letter written March 30th, 1838. Uh, Thomas Rogers at Fort Payne is writing Abner Hepsel. I have the honor to acknowledge the receipt of your letter bearing the date 28 instant. Have to state that Mr. Lenore is with us, but will leave in a day or two for Gunner's Landing for the purpose of entering on the duties of quartermaster to the anticipated company at that point. I feel somewhat embarrassed on the account of not having funds sufficient to settle my accounts and will have to make a part of them unsettled until next quarter. I am inclined to believe that I can make my accounts from a trout correctly and would prefer, provided it meets your approbation, to send them up as my business increase and needs my constant attention. I have not as much money on hand as I think Mr. Lenore should have, but will give him all I can spare. 
If you are still of the opinion he should purchase a wagon team and express horses, please inform me or him as he would be rather at a loss on that subject. The distance from Fort Payne to Cedar Bluff is 20 miles and is a passable road, but rather rough. So if you know much about Southern history, you know you have heard of the Lenore family. And there are five large collections of their papers. The University of North Carolina, Duke University, University of Tennessee, uh, the uh, McClung Collection in Knoxville, and the Chattanooga Public Library all have huge collections. So, you know, what do you do if you're a researcher? Well, you start asking questions and you ask people you think would know and ask Vicki Rosemont, who gave excellent advice. The University of Tennessee Lenore family papers. And in the finding aid, there are financial matters with Fort Cass, financial matters with Fort Payne, and an account with Fort Lovell, Alabama, 1838. And it was a gold mine of records. It includes all kinds of papers. Abstract of forage issued to Indian, Indian horses, not soldiers' horses. Indian horses at Fort Lovell in the quarter ending June 1838. Abstracts of provisions issued to Indians at Fort Lovell during the months of June 1838 by W.A. Lenore. And you read this and it becomes kind of hard to logically follow. On June 5th, 24 Indians, four days commencing June and ending June 8th. 22 for three days, June 6th to June 8th. 50 Indians, four days from the 9th to the 12th. 63 Indians, two days from the 11th to the 12th and so on. And you go, you can kind of, if there's some kind of pattern, but you can't reading this quite follow it. And, but if you make it into a chart, all of a sudden what you get is the picture of a roundup. The number of uh, Cherokee brought into the camp, into Fort Lovell, how many there were being taken care of. So from the 5th to the 17th, 12 days, that was the roundup. Very quick, very efficient. But the on, this is the only thing I have found so far to show exactly what happened. If you look at head count, this is net head count. You don't know if people were, were anyone was dying or being sent off. There was a small group uh, of elderly, sick and infirmed, Cherokee, who were not removed, who stayed there and were later moved to Fort Payne. If you look at this, you do see the bands of people being brought in and what the, what the roundup looked like, how coldly, coldly efficient. So the, the roundup and the removal was not a political event, it was a military event. Also in the, uh, the papers of Lenore collection was uh, a bill of sale which was the auction that took place at Fort Lovell on the 30th of July, 1838. And you get this list of quote, all the leftover stuff, papers and harnesses and horses and leftover iron and locks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but a list of names is never just a list of names. You know, one of the things is you do, you try to squeeze as absolute much as you can out of everything that you find. Uh, Cherokee County may have lost its deed records, but it was a U.S. government, U.S. land state. So you can take this list of names and you look to see, well, of these people who got land patents. And if you mark that on a map, thanks to Lamar Marshall, all of a sudden you see there are two clusters, a cluster on the south 
uh, side of the Chattooga River and a cluster on the north side of the Chattooga River. So you have zoomed in a little bit and you know kinda maybe where the fork could have been. Uh, it's not perfect, but you get to that point. One of the important things for me, anytime that, that you're researching is to look for the voice uh, of a Cherokee. Uh, this is an 1842 claim filed by a Cherokee named Head Thrower Watts. And he was a son of the Chickamauga chief, uh, John Watts. And his witness was his nephew, Corntassel. And in his claim, this is what he happens to say. I was on this place, on the Chattooga, when I was forced to move to this country. The soldiers were taking the people and a white man who took possession of my place, loaned me his wagon and took me into camp, off to a little garrison or fort on Chattooga, which was made to keep us in, and about three miles from where I lived. I took up my household and kitchen furniture as much as we could put in the wagon and expected we would be allowed to return for the things I left. I was put into one of the forts or garrison and there guarded until they marched just away from that place to another and never was permitted to go outside the garrison. So his testimony matched what we saw in the rations. Now, head thrower, this is evaluation of his improvements in 1836, lived near Fort Armstrong. In the returns of property, which not many people ever look at, he was listed in there. And it said that there was some disagreement over whether he had been dispossessed or had sold uh, some livestock to a David J. White. People who know, who hear me talk about claims will say, I, I always say, pay attention to who the perpetrators are. Maybe you can, can find information by looking at them. David White also was purchaser of uh, items belonging to Cooper, who lived at Little River, to Gritz, who lived near Fort Armstrong, and to Waddy, that or probably Waddy, who lived near Fort Armstrong. Now, unfortunately, David White didn't enter land. He was there in 1840, but no clue specifically where he may have been living. Cherokees lived in community. It's a huge part of Cherokee culture. Family, clan members, friends, and neighbors. So this is a list of Cherokee who lived in the area. Number 147 in the middle in red is Head Thrower, he lived on the waters of the Coosa River near Fort Armstrong. Couple down, uh, 152 is his brother, John Watts. A couple above John is Tassel Campbell, who was their half brother. Uh, between them is Jackson Mankeller. Jackson at the time was married to their sister. Uh, way at the top, you can see Grits, who David White bought from. There's Charlie Downing, 133 in green. There is um, Eli Smith, who's number 129, and Jackson Mankeller were both grandsons of Principal Chief Pathkeller. Man, the Mankeller, number 131, who's listed by Eli Smith, was the ancestor, is the ancestor of the late Principal Chief Wilma Mankeller. So this fort is where her family came through. Almost all of these people, not all of them, but almost all of them immigrated west in the John Bench detachment. It's important to always remember, we're talking about real people with real families and real communities. It's not mythology. This is a list um, of Cherokee at Ross's Landing who were given some clothing, supplies. On the right page, uh, about in the middle, you'll see a faint red box, uh, which includes head thrower. 
and there are four miners listed after him. Uh, Ijasate, Nancy, Ayuka, and Chialuski. I suspect those are his children, but I, there is no proof to that. Charlie Downing, who I pointed out earlier, was listed right after him. Uh, so if you look back, this is the area. Uh, uh, the Coosa River was dammed in the late 50s um, for hydroelectric power. But you can see, you can see the roads as they were then, see where the major roads were then. So this was what had been accomplished by the time the report had written. When you start at zero, a lot was accomplished. So if a location, give or take 10 square miles, is a conclusion to be satisfied with, then you would have accomplished a lot of your goal of finding the fort. But if curiosity and perseverance prevail, you press on. The research question still remained unanswered. In the records of the Office of the Commissary General of Subsistence is a letter from George Gibson uh, to Lieutenant Hoskins, said the provisions returns of issues at Forts Cass, Hetzel, Lovell, Cleveland, Hoskins, Hornsett, Gilmer, Likens, Buffington, Cumming, Noon, Newman, Means, Floyd, Morrow, and Payne have been sent to the third auditor, auditor for settlement. Well, what's the third auditor? And what was sent there for settlement? So a big, big kudo to Stephen Dennis, who was on this call, who persevered and looked. Uh, this is specifically Record Group 217, Records of the Accounting Officers, the Department of the Treasury. The entry, there was one entry in those records, 712, settled accounts and claims and related records, 4,760 feet of records. That is almost 16 football fields. 16 football fields of one entry. And in this, these are the records found for Fort Lovell. Barrels of flour and bacon and sugar and soap and rice and candles. Vouchers for iron and blacksmithing and candles and quills and desks and tables and chairs and wagons and horses. Harnesses, mattocks, wedges, grindstones, crosscut saws, locks, drawing knives, augers, chisels, axes, stocks. Every detail. Interesting, most interesting to me is the lumber. Uh, a man named David Mangum was paid for two large orders of lumber. 3,150 feet of plank on one and 3,145. Fort Lovell had a, a total of 4, 000, almost 4,500 feet of plank and 325 pounds of nails. The fort just to the north, Fort Likens, had 12,400 feet of planking. Now, wood doesn't go get from a mill to a site on its own, it has to be hauled. And the hauling created more vouchers. Fort Lovell had approximately 50 days of hauling, though some of those days were for forage and also for hauling Indians. Fort Likens had 70 plus days of hauling, timber and forage. Lumber doesn't put itself together automatically. It takes the efforts of humans to do that. This is an extra duty pay receipt roll. And this is for, for Captain Watts com Company, the company that was at Fort Lovell. And it was work necessary for the purposes connected with building fort and storehouses. 
And if you total this up, there's 1,172 days of labor. Assuming that is eight hours of labor a day, it would total 9,376 hours of labor to build a fort. Um, one thing I found interesting was in this entire list, all these names of soldiers, not one soldier signed with an X, not one gave their mark. Everyone I expected more illiteracy. So if you compare, and, and this is, what do you learn from Fort Lovell by comparing it to other forts? Fort Lovell had 4,495 feet of planking. Fort Lykins had 12,400. Fort Lovell had 1,172 days of labor. Fort Lykins had 2,169 days of labor. And you look at, at total hours of labor, talking about 9,376 hours versus 17,352 hours. Why was one fort so much larger than the other? This is the, uh, the sketch of Fort Butler. Uh, Brett Riggs has suggested that the model for building a fort was scalable. And if you look at the two forts, Fort Likens and Fort Lovell, you see that. You don't know exactly what they look like, but you can see that it was a scalable model. Uh, Fort Turkey Town, which was a small camp uh, further down into Turkey Town, uh, had little to no construction. Fort Cumming in Lafayette had more, but far from the amount of construction that Fort Lovell and Fort Likens had. There is some kind of implication of a plan for what, what and why, but no one's found anything yet to explain why. Um, this was a voucher for a man named John Patey, and he was hired to haul Indians from Fort Lovell to Port, Fort Poinsett. And there are not vouchers for only him. There are lots of vouchers for the hauling of Indians and their property from Fort Lovell to Fort Poinsett. If you remember what Head Thrower Watt said, they moved us to another fort. So evaluating evidence is, is it consistent with everything else that you're being told? That's exactly what you saw in the head count of, from the rations. So if you look on a, on a map, pull way back out, um, you will see here's Path Killers Ferry, which is where the principal chief lived, where he died and where he's buried. Um, you see Turkey Town over here, where the Turkey Town Council House was, where the Treaty of 1816 was uh, ratified. Here's Terrapin Creek. Terrapin Creek, somewhere down here is where Fort Turkey Town was. Uh, you see Cedar Bluff or Jefferson, which was up here. Uh, at the time this was done, there were people who suspected that Fort Lovell was on this side of the river. You know, I didn't subscribe to that. I didn't think it made sense. Um, but from a broad area, you can see if the purpose was to get Cherokee from here to Fort Poinsett, to remove them from their homes as quickly, as efficiently, uh, with as much shock and awe as, as could be done, you see why they did what they did. Here's a voucher for the hire of a team from the 13th to 23rd, transporting Indians from Terrapin Creek, that would have been Fort Turkey Town, to Fort Likens, not to Fort Likens, to Fort Likens, which they hopscotched over Fort Lovell to move the Cherokee as far away from their home as they could quickly. Several men were paid for doing this. This is the published report of a U.S. Supreme Court case, and it involves a, a, a creek uh, 
reservation under the Treaty of 1832. Um, and it's a Cherokee man named George Augerhole, uh, who lived on Ball Play Creek. His wife, his wife was a Creek. And it says here on the bottom of this page is there was no proof as to the manner in which Auger Hole was first taken by the troops. There was proof showing that he was taken. He, together with about 500 Cherokee, were kept by the troops at Fort Larkins, which is Fort Likens. And they said in the state of Georgia, and it was close to state line, but it was in Alabama. <laughs> so the records you find are consistent. So picking up where where we left off years ago, a lot more was accomplished, but close only counts in horseshoes. You press on. The research question is to identify Fort Lovell's specific location. Specifically, where was the fort? So what do you do? You take your own advice. When you give advice, you ought to take it. Keep a detailed research log of everything you do Review, review the log in depth, engage with others who have expertise you do not, be your own toughest critic, look for holes, reevaluate everything. In this presentation, I left a glaring hole of something I missed. I'm not gonna ask you if you saw it, but it was there. The Lenore Papers. I only looked at one. We only looked at one collection because it was the gold mine. Why look anywhere else? Jack and I were in Knoxville uh, last year uh, when the Rem Remember the Removal Riders were in town, and went to the University of Knoxville, and also went to the McClung Collection, and we had a long list as you do your. Reach always exceeds your grasp. I'd spent all day looking at court cases and Jack was uh, looking at manuscript collections. And this specific collection at McClung does not have a finding aid. So it was the end of the day and they were actually starting to click lights off. Jack was scanning furiously. Uh, I walked in and we had a, a couple of minutes left. So I literally just opened a box noticed the files and there was no finding aid again and they were listed by date so i opened it up and the first thing i saw was a letter dated may 11 1838 from fort lovell from william a lenore to his father and he said in this letter there is but one company at this post captain watts we arrived here about the 15th ultimate have our stores and block house completed We'll be finished, we'll about finish the fort next week. Our station is a beautiful one, three miles from Jefferson, formerly Cedar Bluff, one and a half miles from the Coosa River. There is an excellent limestone spring about 200 yards from the fort, which is on a high hill. The Indians, I think, have lost all hope of an alteration in the treaty. So you review all the things you have, 20 or 22 miles from Fort Payne, 15 miles from Fort Likens, three miles from Jefferson or Cedar Bluff, about three miles from Hithrow or Watts improvement on the Chattooga near Fort Armstrong, one and a half miles from the Coosa River on a hill with a limestone spring about 200 yards away. The research question was what was the specific location a fort level used in 1838 for the removal of a Cherokee in Northeast Alabama. There it is. A couple of observations of sometimes you don't see things that are right in front of your eyes. So these are the two uh, topo maps that show the locations of Fort Payne and Fort Likens. Both of these, there are hills and springs. Sometimes you just don't see what's right in front of your eyes. I don't know if this is 
a coincidence just based on this area, or if it is also something the military looked for at every location of a fort. So it's, it's not a theory and it's not a hypothesis. It's just at this point, an observation. Don't you wish someone had looked at that Lenore collection years ago? Well, yes, uh, but no. Because it would, have, would not have put effort into finding. All the other records. There are over 180 vouchers for goods and services provided by Fort Lovell by a large number of diverse people. There are over 20 men who purchased items at the auction at Fort Lovell. There was an entire company of men serving under Captain Watts. Out of the 78 total men, at least 38 or their heirs filed for or received bounty land. 12 men received military pensions. Any or many of these men, and if you remember to, through the payroll, they were all literate. They could have written letters. Maybe somebody wrote a letter to their sister in St. Louis, and that's in a collection somewhere. Uh, maybe they kept a diary or a journal, but you don't know. Uh, the latest piece of evidence we found is actually yesterday. Jeff Sauls, who was on this call, his ancestor was one of the soldiers in Captain Watt's company. And he was one of the men who got a pension. And it says that he enlisted at Gadsden, which was then known as uh, Double Springs, and that they were discharged at Gunner's Landing. Uh, no reason to know why in the world the company went to Gunner's Landing. But it's an interesting question to be researched. That you don't know that you don't know what you don't know. So the site still exists even after the inundation of the lake. The water level is higher now because of the lake. So some places are marshier than, the, than they were in 1838, but it's still there. I do not know if any Cherokee died or buried there. Uh, this has been used as a, and is being used still as a cemetery. History, not mythology, is what we're involved in. The depth, the texture, the completeness, the fullness of the story of the removal matters. The Cherokee who suffered the removal matter. The actual physical context of the removal matters. It does matter what we can prove. And that's my presentation. Oh, that's wonderful. Thanks very much, Mike. That was great. Thank wonderful. You. Are so, you going to it, take questions? Yeah, I'll take questions. I may or may not know the answer. Uh, and I would say I will hope that other people, um, the late Gail King, before she passed away, who was the author of that first report, she asked me, she says, Mike, do you think we made mistakes? And I said, absolutely, we made mistakes. You know, don't, don't be fearful of making a report